Check it out, Startup Nation. I know many of you are trying to improve your marketing performance, right? You have your business or your e-commerce store, and you're trying to increase that brand awareness. No worries. I got you. You should listen to the brand new Keep Optimizing podcast. That's optimizing with an S and not a Z. It's a marketing podcast that will provide you with not only the latest tips and advice in the game, but also you will hear from experts in their field when it comes to email marketing, SEO, and more. This is a must-listen-to podcast for my e-commerce entrepreneurs. It's hosted by Chloe Thomas, who is a 15-year marketing expert, best-selling author, and award-winning podcast host. It's already a top 20 marketing podcast in seven countries, so clearly you're going to get amazing value every episode. So as you can see, Style Nation, you're in good hands with my girl CT. So listen and subscribe to the Keep Optimizing podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you like to get your favorite podcast. You can also get more information at keepoptimizing.com. The link is there in the show notes. It's time to be about that life, the startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation, so I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, we talk from, to people from all walks of life when it comes uh, to uh, entrepreneurship and business and things of that nature. But what have I told you today's guest actually created a sport? Well, you're in luck. Because uh, we have the founder and CEO of Spikeball. You may be wondering what is Spikeball. We got the perfect person to kind of tell us about that. His name is Chris Ruder. CR, what's up, man? Not much. Thanks for having me on. No worries. No worries, man. You know what? Thank you so much for coming on the show. If you would, man, just kind of share your origin story with us, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So um, Spikeball is a game that came around. It launched back in 1989. So I was like 14 years old at the time. Gotcha. Um, and it was launched in 1989. And I think it was killed in 1991. So mm. it had a very, very short life. But um, some of my buddies back then um, picked up a few spike ball sets at the local toy store, gotcha. brought it back to the neighborhood. And um, they were actually friends with my older brother. Uh, so they'd play a bunch. They fell in love with the game. And you know, I thought it was pretty cool, but I was kind of the younger brother, you know, so that means I'm not really allowed to hang out with them. Of course. Uh, but I, it looked fun. I played a little bit. Um, but fast forward to 2003, mm -hmm. me, my brother, those friends, we all went on a trip to Hawaii. And that's where I really got the bug for it. Um, and I guess to do a quick description, those of you that don't know what spike ball is, you may have seen people in like a local park or a beach or something playing this weird game that kind of looks like a, a small trampoline. Um, but rather than jumping on it, you've got a small inflatable rubber ball that you are basically spiking off it or bouncing off it. So two teams play two on two, very similar to like two on two volleyball, but rather than hitting the ball over the net, you're spiking the ball off the net. Uh, Google how to play spike ball, and that'll make a lot more sense than the words that I just shared with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I really got the bug in. Uh, we went on that trip in 2003, I believe it was. Right. Um, and when we were playing, people would stop and ask us these same three questions. They'd say, what's that game? How do you play? And where can I get it? Mm. Um, and enough people asked us those questions where we started thinking like, huh, I wonder if we could actually like bring this thing back to life. Like, you know, we love this game. All these strangers keep walking up to us and asking us about it. Like, I wonder if we could uh, do this. So, you know, we, we did what I think a lot of people do with ideas are, you know, we just talked about it. We never actually did anything. Right. Um, and eventually I got sick of the talk and I said, all right, guys, I'm going to talk to some attorneys and see if we can actually bring this thing back to life. Cause I have no idea how that, how that works. So, <laughs> right. um, talked to the attorneys. They said, yeah, the trademark, which protects the name has been expired for, I don't know, 10, 15 years or something like that. And there never was a patent for the product. So you can go ahead and do what you want. Um, you know, we did uh, track down the guy that invented it um, and talked about maybe bringing it back together. And that didn't quite work out. So we went ahead and did it on our own. Um, incorporated in 2007 and then launched in uh 2008 so gotcha. um 
yeah, hopefully that answers your question without no, rambling too much. No, it, it absolutely does, man. Well, let me let me ask a follow up. You know, actually, let, t- talk to me about launching Spike Ball in two thousand eight because that was a unique time to launch uh, a, a very unique company <laughs> at the time. Talk about that uh, transition, if you don't mind. Yeah, it um, so it was a transition, but you know. We, we raised a total of about $100,000, and that was between me, my brother, uh, my cousin, and a few of the, those other childhood friends. Gotcha. Um, and once we had had the, you know, we, I think our initial order was about 1,000 spike ball sets. Mm-hmm. You know, we had to work with a product developer to, you know, upgrade the design, make it stronger, make it look better, branding people, packaging people. We had to have a website built and... Um, you know, by the time we had paid all those bills, there really was not much money left in the bank account. Like, you know, there was no, not enough money for any of us to work at Spikeball full time. Right. So it was a side job. Um, and, you know, I think had I quit my day job when we launched, that would have been a much, much riskier uh, approach. Um, and, you know, at that time, you know, we launched in June of 2008. My first child was born in March of 2008. Mm. Um, so I had a newborn, I had a mortgage, had car payments, um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of pressure that, you know, I couldn't quite rely on, you know, this, this spike ball thing to actually help me pay the bills. So, right. um, took a pretty conservative approach and said, all right, let's, let's go ahead and run this thing, but it's going to be a night job. And hopefully one day it'll turn into something, but if it doesn't, you know, my kids are still going to be able to eat. I'll be okay. And, you know, we'll, hopefully we will have had some fun giving it a shot. For sure. um, you know, the economy was totally up in the air in 2008. Um, and nobody knew which way things were going to go. Um, I did have a stable day job. I was selling advertisements for, I think I worked for Microsoft at the time. Um, so I had a pretty good job. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, a lot of people thought, you know, like, you know, spike ball was this huge risky thing and it was, but I think a lot of people look at entrepreneurs like, oh my gosh, you guys are so comfortable with risk and you're, you know, I could never do that sort of thing. And I disagree with that a little bit. And I think entrepreneurs are comfortable with calculated risk. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's definitely. Oh, so that's, more accurate I think it's a big difference. You know, and I, and I ran the company for five years as that night job. And it was only once in like, I think it was 2013, um, we hit a million dollars in annual revenue with zero full-time employees. And then and only then did my wife and I feel comfortable for me to quit the job and go full-time. Got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. So, and I don't, I will transition, but I want to ask one more thing. Talk to me about that conversation with your wife. Like, you know, you know, I want to kind of vet this idea of spike ball (laughs) during 2008. And, you know, keep in mind, it's it's, it's the economic recession. You just said you had uh, a daughter. I mean, uh, you had a daughter, right? Uh, son. son, daughter yeah, was son. the. I've got three kids now. Got, the right, daughter right, was number right. three. Yeah, right, right. So you had a son at the time, stuff like that. Talk to me about that conversation with your wife at the time. That has to be an interesting conversation. Yeah, she was. She was and is super cool about you know the whole thing. She know. I think she recognized that it was something I was passionate about. Fair enough. And I was never passionate about my day jobs. I did well at them. They paid well. I liked the people I worked with well enough, but. It was, it was a job. It was kind of a nine to five. And when I came home, I would rarely say, oh my God, I had such a great day. Let me tell you about this. And I had just kind of been doing what I've been doing. And I think one reason she was so supportive of it is she recognized, she heard a different tone in my voice. She saw a pep in my step. And when I was talking about spike ball, and um, I think that's what made her so supportive of it. And, you know, when I did eventually quit and go full time, It wasn't like I woke up one day and said, hey, honey, I think next week I'm going to give my two weeks notice. Are you cool with it? You know, we had been talking about it for months and it was something like, "Okay, all these puzzle pieces have to fall into place in order for for this to happen. So, again, it was it was pretty well calculated. Gotcha. No, I definitely understand that for sure. And and Startup Nation, if you want to kind of check out uh, an idea of what Spikeball looks like, go to Spikeball.com. I'm actually on the website right now and right there on the front page, you see. 
uh, uh, like people kind of playing right now. They got it's all illuminated, which makes it even extra cool uh, <laughs> on there for sure. So I want to make sure uh, I, I get that in. So let's talk about the business side uh, of Spike Ball uh, a little bit. You know, you have a twenty five million dollar business, twenty five employees, presence worldwide, and zero agencies man how you manage to you know manage all that you know and, and do it in house man kind of talk about that scaling process a little bit yeah we um you know i'm i'd love to say it's all me and you know i'm just so <laughs> smart and i did this all on my own but gotcha. um the, the the team that i've been lucky enough to to work with and and find um you know, it's gotten to the point now where sometimes I, I get lonely. Uh, you know, you'd think as CEO, I'm just, you know, running around, putting fires out and just everything's crazy and so busy and working crazy hours. And right. it, it couldn't be further from that. Yes, there's stressful days and, um, you know, there, there's good days and bad days. And some days I am working crazy hours, but for the most part, it is a, it's a, a, a calm environment. And I, I think one, one reason that that is we, most employees have all employees have just a lot of autonomy. Mm. Um, they take ownership of whatever it is they're responsible for. Um, and if there, if, if a fire erupts, I'll usually only hear about it after the fire has been put out. Fair enough. Um, the employees, they know they, they have the, uh, the right or the ability, and it's we expect them to take ownership. You know, one of our values is own it. Gotcha. Um, and I, I have worked at other companies where, as soon as something may go wrong, they send it up the flagpole, and now they expect the CEO to kind of come in and solve everything. And while that may fix the problem, then it, you know that person's probably not going to learn. Um, right. And I know when I had the day jobs that I really wasn't all that engaged, I really had no autonomy. Um, I didn't have any decision-making authority. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of how I'm trying to build things at Spikeball is based on what I just didn't like at those jobs. Um, And there was a lot about those jobs. So, you know, whether this is your first quote professional or real job, uh, whether you went to college or not, or whether you've been working for 20 years you're going to get the same amount of freedom and uh, we hired you because you're a smart person and we expect you to be able to, to figure things out. And, you know, especially, you know, when we first started hiring people, they were, they were kind of generalists, you know, nobody had ever really done this sort of thing before right. and, but really good at learning things on the fly. Now that we're, you know, a much larger company, um, still small, you know, when compared to, to other ones, but you know, right. biggest we've ever been. Um, we are starting to hire more and more specialists, you know, people that have done this in a previous, at a previous role and they, they show up on day one with that expertise. For sure. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of the fact that I can sleep well at night and not have to work so crazy is that the team's got it under control and they know that I'll give them whatever support they need if they try solving something and they can't they know anytime they call or send me a note, I'm going to answer and we'll, I'll, I'll help them out. But it's rare that it actually comes to me. For sure. For sure. And I definitely, you know, uh, appreciate you sharing that. And it really speaks to the culture you, you clearly have built uh, there at Spike Ball, where, you know, you, you talked about, uh, you know, uh, the putting out the fires that you don't know about the fires until, you know, uh, you know, they're already kind of put out. So that really speaks to that culture. And, and you know, Startup Nation, we're also hearing uh, with Chris that we, we've we heard with other uh, very successful entrepreneurs. You know, actually, Chris, we had on uh, Mark Randolph, the co-founder of Netflix, and he talked about that same model as far as like the early days of Netflix. You had a lot of generalists and stuff like that. And then as the company grew over time, you start to bring in those uh, specialists. And I think that's a very important. Uh, important distinction uh, when you're talking about scaling a company. So I appreciate you sharing that insight and reinforcing that insight as well. Yeah, I think it's, I haven't studied many other companies, but yeah, I would guess that's a common thing. You know, a lot of our initial hires, we host tournaments all over the country and they're happening all over the world now. And a lot of the, our first hires were people I met at tournaments. Mm. Um, You know, people that were sort of already a part of our community. Gotcha. you know, they weren't childhood friends or people that I just, you know, uh, but they were people that I had met. They had already had sort of the spike ball bug. You know, they were way into the product. They loved playing. 
Uh, when they kind of heard how the company's being run and how we're growing, I think they were very intrigued and wanted to get closer to that. Right. Um, so it's been nice um, to be able to find people there. You know, as we're looking for more and more specialists, you know, we can't sort of, you know, keep fishing off our own dock, if you will. Right. Um, so we are trying to find new communities of, you know, people that have extra various different types of expertise, people that don't necessarily look like us. So let's try and, you know, bring more people of color on board and just get into maybe communities that where they've never heard of spike ball. Got you. And that's going to, I think, make the company just that much more, that much stronger. Got you. You know, I I, want to, I guess, make a statement and then ask a follow up question, Uh, because, you know, it it seems like that seems like a very smart approach you took. And, And I guess that's why it speaks to the culture uh, that you have there at Spike Ball, because if you're hiring people who are, you know, already within the community, that means they're already invested and they're invested in the success of what you're doing. That's fair to say, right, Chris? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And that's great. We want them. Right. But the world's way bigger than our community. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Which, which brings me to, you know, uh, you know, uh, my follow up question. You, and you broached this subject. You talked about bringing in different communities, people of color, uh, stuff like that. And, and given you know, that, uh, you know, the kind of the, uh, the, the time and place we are in society these days when it, when it comes to, uh, diversity and inclusion and such sort of thing, talk about, you know, that mission at spike ball to kind of, you know, or I guess more accurately talk about what that approach looks like to bring in that, to have that inclusion, to bring in people of color, to bring in people that may not yep. look like yourself, kind of talk about what that looks like at spike ball and, and bringing that in. Yeah, um, we've still got a whole heck of a lot to learn. So I'd love to say, yes, we've got it figured out and we're the gold standard, but not even close. But we have made a good amount of progress, especially this year. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you go to any of our tournaments right now, well, they're all canceled right now due to COVID. But if they were going on, um, you'd see that it's almost all white guys. Um, We've got maybe... 10% 10% women if we're lucky, um, but not racially diverse whatsoever. Gotcha. Um, so that's something we're trying to figure out. We've noticed that a lot of people experience first experience our product in uh, gym class in schools. Mm, um, gotcha. So PE teachers love spike ball. You know, it's relatively inexpensive. You can make up all sorts of different rules and, you know, you can really play it anywhere. So um we're starting to explore, okay, let's look at all the schools that we're in. Is there much racial diversity at those schools? If not, okay, that's a problem. Let's now start trying to engage with schools where there is a lot more diversity, a lot more people of color. So when the student now goes to gym class and they're in fifth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, whatever, um, they're now going to be introduced to it. Um, so that's one angle on the employment side. Um, We've been trying for a couple of years now to attract uh, people of color and have just absolutely failed. Gotcha. Um, I went down to Howard University maybe a year, year and a half ago. Okay. Um, spoke to a couple of classes, gave away a bunch of free sets. And that was my way of like, all right, let's establish a relationship here. Maybe we can make it like a hiring pipeline. You know, uh, we've seen that like tons of college kids love the product. Mm-hmm. Um The professor was super cool. The kids were engaged. They had great questions. Um, I got a couple follow-up emails from some of them, but nothing was really clicking. Got you. Um, And in all of our hiring, we had, up until this year, we had never used a recruiter. Mm. Um, We had, you know, built sort of this cult following of this brand. And we were, I don't know, maybe a bit arrogant is the word, but we just figured that, you know, people would find us. Gotcha. we changed that this year. I hear that. Uh, we used uh, a recruiter, and that has made all the difference in the world. Got you. Um, so we've hired, uh, I think, five people of color this year. Okay. Um, and while we still got a ways to go, um, I'm already just seeing different cultures showing up and different, you know, different groups being represented. And some come from traditional backgrounds; other, not others, not 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 at all. Right. And I love that. Um, just seeing, you know, we've got some people that went to Ivy League colleges working at Spike Ball and mm-hmm. some people that have never gone to college. Gotcha. Um, and that I just absolutely love that. 
you know, one, one cool thing, you know, our product literally brings people together. One person buys it, but then you have to go find three people to actually play. Right. I'd love to see, you know, let's, can we get people of different backgrounds, colors, races, everything together with our products? Like that'd be fantastic. Gotcha. We got a lot of way, we got a lot of work to do to figure it out, but I am feeling good with, with the progress we've been making so far. Gotcha. You know, small steps. I, I definitely understand that. And I think a lot of times, you know, uh, cause let's be honest, you, you see a lot of companies, especially given, you know, everything that's going on. And I mean, let's be honest, it's lip service. It's, it's window dressing. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's, Absolutely. It's not really a, the structural uh, core. So, you know, kudos to what you're doing and your team there at Spike Ball, but also kudos uh, to you, man, to say, you know what, um, you know, I, I need to do it differently. I need to get a recruiter involved, you know, and get out of the mindset of like, oh, they'll just find me. This is dope. This is what I'm doing is cool. They'll find me. But to to, to make that transition, because not all entrepreneurs make that transition, man. So I appreciate you sharing it and being transparent. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a, obviously it can be a touchy subject and, um, you know, I just, you know, I'm, all, I'm also trying to figure out like, is there something that we as a company are inadvertently doing mm. that is keeping people of color from wanting to apply? Gotcha. Um, you know, I, I met with, um, uh, somebody this was about a year or so ago and they had clicked around on our website and we were talking, we were talking about this topic and she said, Chris, on the about us uh, page of your website, you've got a photo of all of your employees and it's basically mm. 20 white people on a beach. Got you. And she's like, Chris, me being a black woman, I'm probably not going to want to click the apply button when I see that. Got you. Um, so she encouraged us to take it down. It took me a couple months to think about it and said, you know what? I think that's actually the right call. So we did. Got you. And that's just, that's one thing, you know, and we're also, I'm encouraging our, uh, the company and like, I want us all to be thinking about what are we inadvertently doing um, to not engage? And I don't think anybody has a mean bone in their body at spike ball, but you know, myself included, there's probably some things I could be doing differently. You know? So we are, you know, uh, Bridget who works at spike ball, she's started a book club gotcha. and we are wrapping up uh, how to be anti-racist right now. We did white fragility before that. Gotcha. Uh, I'm trying to think what, but basically we're just trying to look inward and say, all right, guys, like are, we probably are a part of the problem and we don't even realize it. Right. Um, right. So just having those sensitive, difficult, call them what you will conversations internally, I think is a great first step as well. Yes. We donate money to nonprofits. Yes. We'll do black Lives matters posts and kind of everything that other companies are doing. That is the lip service. I do want the world to know that that's what we believe in. Right. Um, we take a lot of flack for it and I don't care. Go ahead and click the unfollow button. I'm fine with that. Um, but we, we do way more than that. And I, I want to, I want, um, yeah, I, I want the world to know that, but I also am hoping that it will get us to a pay place where, um, um, uh, we've just, we want our, we, we have a five-year strategic plan and gotcha. we added earlier this year to that, that we want our um, employee base to reflect that of overall society. For sure. Um, so we want half men and women. We want, uh, I think African-Americans maybe make up 13, 14% of general population. And let's start there um, and then just see where things go. And, you know, every study under the sun will tell you the more diverse your company is, the stronger it will be and the better it will be. So. Yes, I want to do it because I think it's just the right thing. But the capitalist in me loves it because it's going to make my company stronger. Absolutely, absolutely. Because um, I mean, cause so, di yeah. diversity and inclusion, it, it also is not just what it looks like. It's also diversity of thought and different backgrounds and different perspectives on, on things. So, man, look, kudos to you. Kudos to doing that work as African American male myself, man. I appreciate one hundred percent of everything <laughs> you just said because it's, it's not just. You know, yeah, you like you could have just did the Black Lives Matter post, right? You yep. you did, you, you know, you could have just did that. You did that. Then you could have just maybe you just hired some people. You could have just did that as well. But also, once you hired those people, you start listening and, and, and doing some of that work. And I, I'm not going to blame this point for the I promise we're going to transition here. But I just want to <laughs> say thank you so much. That means a lot. 
uh, to this host and and to the uh, uh, people who look like me, if that makes any sense. So I yeah, I, I absolutely. We I wish we would have started it sooner. I'm, I'm but better late than never. Right. And um, You're doing the work. We got now, a lot. Bro. We got a lot of work to do. I hope to talk to you again in the next year or two and give you an update that is hopefully putting us way further than where we are. All right, Startup Nation. So we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break. We gotta pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson, and you're listening to the Startup Life. Check it out, Startup Nation. I know many of you are trying to improve your marketing performance, right? You have your business or your e-commerce store, and you're trying to increase that brand awareness. No worries. I got you. You should listen to the brand new Keep Optimizing podcast. That's optimizing with an S and not a Z. It's a marketing podcast that will provide you with not only the latest tips and advice in the game, but also you will hear from experts in their field when it comes to email marketing, SEO, and more. This is a must-listen-to podcast for my e-commerce entrepreneurs. It's hosted by Chloe Thomas, who is a 15-year marketing expert, best-selling author, and award-winning podcast host. It's already a top-20 marketing podcast in seven countries, so clearly you're going to get amazing value every episode. So as you can see, Stoutermation, you're in good hands with my girl, CT. So listen and subscribe to the Keep Optimizing podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you like to get your favorite podcast. You can also get more information at keepoptimizing.com. The link is there in the show notes. Oralex powers this episode of The Startup Life. Startup Nation, as a podcaster, radio host, and business owner, I know a thing or two about the need for your message to come through clearly to your target audience. The last thing you want when trying to close a big deal over the phone or giving a sales presentation in your conference room is to have the person you are talking to be distracted by either the fact that you sound like you're in a warehouse or an outside noise like a fire truck. Trust me, Startup Nation. I know this all too well from experience. And that is why Oralex has your back. Oralex Acoustics creates professionally tested products that you can trust in a commercial space or at home. Better office acoustics improves intelligibility when video conferencing or generic conversation reduces stress and helps build a proactive work atmosphere. From a home studio for my content creators to your office space downtown, your gear performs better in an acoustically treated room. Trust me, you are in good hands with Oralex as they are the number one brand in acoustics, providing trusted solutions for over 40 years. Also, you can download the Oralex Acoustic Treatment mobile app in the Apple or Google Play Store to give you specifically designed and instantaneous recommendations for various room types. Go to Oralex.com and use the promo code STARTUP in all caps for 10% off your entire order. The link is there in the show notes if you are listening to the replay on the podcast. So if you are ready to stop sounding like you're having a sales meeting in a sports arena, go with Oralex. Professional audio made simple. Tresta powers this episode of The Startup Life. Okay, Startup Nation, I want to talk to you about our sponsor, Tresta. Tresta is an app for iPhone and Android that lets you do business calling and texting from anywhere. I know so many entrepreneurs that are still using their their personal phone number for business calls. It can get complicated drawing the line between your personal and professional life. Startup Nation, this is the best business phone app out there. Whether you just need a business phone number or if your team is ready for a complete business phone system, Tresta is totally flexible and can grow with your business. And it's all unlimited calling, texting, and all of the powerful call management features like auto attendance, call recording, user groups, and more for just $15 per user per month. With Tresta, there's no contract and you don't need any special hardware, just your smartphone you're already using. Tresta is easy to configure so you can set everything up yourself all online avoiding all the hassle and high overhead costs of setting up a traditional business phone system, which is important because as entrepreneurs, we are always trying to cut cost and time. They're often a 30-day free trial so you can see if Tresta's virtual phone system is right for you. Communicate smarter and more efficiently with Tresta. Start now at Tresta.com forward slash Startup Life. That's T-R-E-S-T-A dot com forward slash Startup Life. The link is there in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast. Tresta, business communication simplified. All right, Startup Nation, welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on The Startup Life. 
I appreciate that, brother. I appreciate that. Once again, Startup Nation, do a quick reset. We're talking to Chris Reuter, the founder and CEO of Spikeball Inc. And once again, if you want to check out that website, we have the link there in the show notes for easy access. If you're listening to the replay uh, on the podcast, spikeball.com. Uh, so let's let's talk shop a little bit more here uh, because I see that, you know, you, you got a lot of people endorsing what you do, man. You, you got the Jonas <laughs> Brothers and Drake and Ryan Seacrest. Uh, I, I'm looking on your Facebook page. We have the link there in the show notes as well. Uh, Startup Nation, where you on college campuses, you know, with tournaments and stuff like that, getting that, that nice ESPN coverage, which is always yeah. kind of cool. Uh, I think I see also uh, Juju Smith-Schuster of the, uh, of the Steelers kind of, you know, uh, playing, getting the game in. I I guess what I want to ask, man, talk about the importance of having the credibility of those college campuses of a of an NFL uh, receiver uh, being on ESPN and that. Talk about why that credibility and getting that credibility is important and how did it come about? Um, It came about like, you know, you that that list of um, celebrities or platforms that you just rattled off there. That's usually when you hear that, that's usually the results of a really good PR firm of course, um, or an advertising campaign or some sort of dollars to exchanging hand. Right. Um, we don't do that. We paid for literally none of what you just talked about. Wow. And um, if you look at the NBA bubble from this summer, um, it was insane how many spike ball posts there were. Like all the teams had, they, they brought sets down there. Um, and that was like their thing to do during the downtime WNBA, the wobble, they did the exact same thing. Right. Um, two days ago, um, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pronounce the name of the team, but a major, uh, Bundesliga team in, uh, Frankfurt, Germany posted right. them playing gotcha. all of these just, you know, yeah, you mentioned NFL teams, MLB, NHL, um, mm-hmm. and they all discovered it just kind of on their own. Now, once we see that they've posted, we will of course reach out to them and say, Hey, we'd love to send you a couple boxes of free stuff. Right. Um, right. and we do that all the time. So we're there to fan the flames. Mm-hmm. Um, but it never starts with us writing a check and saying, will you, we'll give you money if you tell the world you love this product. Like that just feels so inauthentic and Gotcha. It just kind of goes against how kind of what we believe in. So, um, yeah, the Ryan Seacrest thing, that was for the uh, uh, Olympics in Rio a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. I was in bed. It was, I don't know, nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden my phone starts blowing up and friends from all over the country are texting me saying, Ryan Seacrest on his main NBC News coverage of the Olympics started talking about how cool spike ball is. And and it turns out we had no idea. It turns out that the women Canadian women's wrestling team uh, brought their own spike ball set to the Olympic Village as mm-hmm. a way to meet different Olympians from all over the world. You know, think mm-hmm. about it. All these strangers come together for like a month or two during the Olympics. Right. Um, they're stuck there. They're usually only competing maybe four or five days out of the entire time they're down there. So they're bored out of their mind. Um, we've noticed that a lot of Olympians are bringing spike ball sets as a way to meet other Olympians, you know, it's a great icebreaker. Absolutely. Um, and what we're seeing from athletes all over the world is it's becoming a training tool. So you're actually working on your hand-eye coordination on That's your true. agility that and the strength and conditioning coaches, especially in the NBA, they are loving it. Like if you Google uh, like Denver Nuggets spike ball or Mavericks spike ball, you'll see tons of videos. Um, and all the players are talking trash to each other about who's a better player. And they're just having so much fun and <laughs> right. we don't pay for it. It just happens naturally. And the videos, you know, if we were to put out a video, like a professionally perfectly edited video of, right. of an athlete playing consumers are smart. I think they'd see through that. Right. Oh, Spike will just paid them for that. Um, but there's just this authenticity, this, this organic discovery that's happening. And, um, yeah, it's been great to see. And that's when you know you have something good, right? I mean, like when you talk about that word of mouth, I mean, you can have Facebook ads, you can pay for PR or, you know, pay for a spot or whatever the case may be, which isn't cheap, by the way. Uh, yep. But you, you, you can do all those things. But when it just kind of picks up organically, that, you know, word of mouth still trumps all of that. You know what I mean? It, it, at the end of the day, word of mouth is the best marketing tool they'll ever 
be. Absolutely. And so, and so when you have stuff like that, it just goes, show, man, you, you got something good there. Let me ask a follow up, man. I, you know, probably has been you probably have been asked this before, but I guess I want to get your take on it. what you know, how would it feel to you if spike ball, I don't know, became an Olympic sport? It'd be incredible. Um, we actually are looking into it. Okay. Um, so we do have, uh, as a company, we run a bunch of tournaments in the U S. Uh, so normally we do, you know, when COVID's not around, right. Um, we've been doing a national championship for, I think six or seven years now. Mm-hmm. Um, we were supposed to have it, um, actually it was supposed to be, I think next weekend at IMG Academy in Florida. Okay. Yeah. You know, major sports facility, just absolutely beautiful. Right. Um, we had to cancel it. Um, this past Labor Day weekend, uh, you know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we were supposed to have our first ever world championship. That was going to be in Belgium. I think we had about 20 countries registered before we had to cancel it. Um, ESPN wrote an article uh, titled um, How Spikeball Became Mainstream. Like, I did, when I first saw that, I'm like, wow, right. they consider us mainstream? Like, holy smokes. <laughs> um, and, you know, they've started broadcasting some of our tournaments. Right. Um, so the mission of the company is to create the next great global sport. We want to make sure everything we're doing is in interest of that. Gotcha. Um, and I like that, you know, it's, it's, it's great. You know, we're seeing um, groups all over the world forming, forming uh, like formal uh, clubs and stuff and governing bodies. And those are some of the steps you have to take in order to become an Olympic sport. Right. Um, and there's a lot of niche sports um, that have become Olympic sports. So ultimate Frisbee just became, uh, an, uh, they, they became uh, an official sport. Uh, I think it was the IOC. I think that's the, the governing body. Yep, yep. Um, they included ultimate a couple of years ago. I believe break dancing actually just got in as well. I think that's ah. going to be in the 2024 Olympics. Got you. Um, so, you know, five years ago, if you'd asked me the question, I'd laugh and say, you're crazy. <laughs> um, but just seeing the, the growth that we've seen Absolutely. and that's what made me level ask. Of, that's yeah, what made me the ask. level of interest, especially from professional athletes. Right. Um, uh, is telling me like, huh? Yeah, maybe there is a chance. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, that's why I asked the question, man, you, you, you know, you, you have this, you know, you have this organic buy-in that's happening, man. It just seems like that's the trajectory. You know what I mean? So, no, yep. And some people consider it a fun backyard game and that's all they want. And hallelujah. We completely support that. Right. Um, but there are some players that get on airplanes and they try to go get sponsorships and they train all the time and they're doing everything they can to be the best in the world. And, uh, we're trying to serve both of those, which can be a bit difficult, but, right. um, it's been, it's been nice. Right. No, I'm seeing that. Like I'm on, like I said, I'm on your Facebook page and I'm looking at videos and stuff like that. And I see like, like the, the, some of the tournaments and the teams have like branded shirts or whatever. Right. So it's like, yep. you know, corporate America yep. is kind of, weaving on in there aren't they you know so i I, you know and and i understand there's a balance between you know uh you know not diluting the product but also you know i mean there's you know let's be honest there's there's a certain eventualities when it comes to something that's popular you know what i mean so uh, yeah absolutely definitely definitely understand that balance uh let me ask you this man because you was on you were on shark tank and it was one of the most popular episodes on shark tank uh Mm -hmm. but I, i don't want to ask about like what happened on you know what we could see like we can pull up a video and see that i want to know some of the things maybe you've noticed learned or whatever you know comes to mind when you know the, when the cameras weren't rolling like was something you may have learned from one of the sharks when that w- didn't make it to tape or maybe from the one of the producers kind of getting up uh those ranks kind of talk about you know maybe uh something you learned or just noticed while going through that process yeah, it was um, the one thing I remembered. I don't know why I was surprised about it, but I guess you kind of hear people, you know, like anytime you hear some somebody meets a celebrity, one of the first things they say is they were so nice, you know, like it was just a man, like they were like normal, like nice people. Right. Almost as if we're like surprised. Like, um, and I think that was exactly my feeling. Like all the sharks were super cool. Even Mr. Wonderful, you know, I expected <laughs> him to be evil. Um right. But he was super nice. Um, so that was one thing. Um, mm-hmm. The thing, I guess, getting to the show, like after we filmed, 
um, you know, we, we did a deal on the show, right. You finish filming. You're getting ready to leave the studio. You know, it's at Sony Pictures studios. So, you right. know, if you, I don't know much about Hollywood, but you know, we went there and it's right. in Culver city, which right, you know, right next to LA. And mm -hmm. you're in one of these giant buildings that looks like an airport hangar. You know, it's basically those giant movie studios. Um, and the shark tank, uh, set is, this tiny thing in the middle of one of those giant buildings and the right. buildings, all the walls, floors, and ceiling are painted black. Right. I'm um, assuming that so they can do special effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you walk in this cavernous building and then you see like this thing in the middle of the room and with lights and stuff. And it basically looks like this big fake living room. <laughs> <Right>. uh, um, <laughs> and you know, the, the floors of the building are concrete, kind of like a big warehouse would be. Right. But then to the actual set maybe you take six inches up and now you're standing on the actual you know wood flooring mm -hmm. um when you i remember that also this being kind of bizarre you know when the entrepreneur walks through the doors and the doors automatically open right right uh, goes through there's two guys on each side of the door manually opening those that's not automatic i believe that um, i believe that. <laughs> i thought it was kind of weird <laughs> right uh, but when we you know and um you walk through and then they tell you this like, yeah, Chris, we're going to tell you to go. You're going to walk up and you'll see like an X on the floor and you stand there and you'll be facing the sharks and do not say a word. till I don't know if they yell go or action or whatever. I forget, but um, they have to get the cameras and lighting and everything ready. Right. Um, you know, so this is one of the most nerve wracking moments of any entrepreneur's life, anybody, anybody's life. Right. Right. Um, and you have to go stand in front of the sharks. You're maybe 15 feet from them. And you just have to stand in complete silence looking at them for like one to two minutes. <laughs> uh, it could not be more awkward. Right, babe. And then somebody yells action or go. And then you need to say, oh, hi, I'm Chris Ruder. I'm from Chicago. My company is Spikeball Inc. And blah, 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 blah. You know, you go into your sort of memorized pitch. Right. Um, so that was very nerve wracking. Um, but. I think I pitched for about 45 minutes uh, and then we were done. And that was, I think what they told me 45 minutes is about average. I think some people have gone like two hours and some are like, you know, four minutes. They just get booted real quick. Right. Um, but the thing that I didn't quite realize when we finished, you know, that you're saying goodbye and you, you're, you don't, there's no chit chat with you and the sharks before or after the filming or anything like they stay in that seat. And when you're done, you leave and that's it. Gotcha. Uh, the only people you actually talk to are the producers and right. producers are super cool. And, you know, they said, all right, Chris, thanks. Um, um, you did get a deal on the show, but that is no guarantee that you're going to be actually on air. Um, oh, so if okay. we call you, if you're, if you're going to be on air, we'll call you two weeks before the episode airs. If we never call, it's just not going to air. Got you. So I never knew that. Yeah. So we filmed in, I don't know, it was maybe September or of October of 2014. Uh -huh. you know, this is going on five, six years ago. Right. But we filmed in September or October. We didn't go on air until May. Mm. So we had to wait like seven months. And I'm just staring at my phone, <laughs> willing it to ring. I'm like, come on, call me, call me, call me. Gotcha. Um, and to add to the stress, um, you know, we were only going to have a two week notice of when we were going to be on the show. So we had to make sure we had tons of inventory. Of course. Of so course. we had to basically spend our every, you know, last nickel that we had on wow. loading up the warehouse because we manufacture in China and it takes like 90 to a hundred days to get, to get our product. Right. So those seven, eight months were pretty lean in the fact that all of our money was tied up in inventory for an event that we didn't know actually was going to happen. Gotcha. We were crossing our fingers and, you know, thank God it did. And it, you know, we were the final segment of the season finale and we had a huge party at the office and it, it couldn't have turned out better. Um, but, you know, we did do a deal on the show. It actually did not close in real life, um, uh, which that was fine. But, gotcha. um, you know, that's the way some of the some of the deals go. Gotcha. I didn't, didn't didn't realize that either. But no, thank you for that kind of behind the scenes, man. I, I appreciate that because, like I said, you know, you know, not everybody, you know, everybody wants to be on Shark Tank, but they don't know those ins and outs. And I know you have to go through a lot of producers before you even make it before uh, the sharks yep. and stuff. Right. Probably rounds and rounds or whatever. But. But yeah, like the first round of application is you literally like standing in your kitchen doing a <laughs> selfie video, just kind of pitching your product. Right. Um, 
And if they like that, then they'll say, okay, make, make a different video, but make this one. Okay. And then you go through a bunch of rounds of that. And, you know, I did, I, what I successfully avoided, you know, they do like the, the casting calls where, you know, you can go stand in line for 10 hours and hopefully you'll, you'll get in and, you know, thousands of people go to those. And I didn't want to do that. So I, I emailed a guy that I'd met once at like a conference or something like that. He had been on shark tank. Right. And I emailed him saying, Hey, I'd rather just sneak in the back door. I don't want to have to go stand in line forever. Is there any chance you can introduce me to the producers you worked with when you were on the show? Mm, um, and he did. And they replied almost immediately. I think one thing Shark Tank loved about our product is it's so visual. Right. Um, it helps. makes for entertaining TV, you know, right. people diving, hitting a ball and running. And um, so that's, that's how we got in, uh, which, yeah, it was good. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you uh, for sharing that for sure. So before we transition, man, so what, what, what's next for spike ball? What's what, where are you right now? I know you got COVID and stuff like that. And a lot of tournaments are kind of canceled. What's, what's kind of those next steps for uh, you and the company and spike ball? Yeah, we're just hoping to keep growing. Um, gotcha. And this year actually has been um, a fantastic year for business. So with COVID hitting, you know, as soon as it first hit, um, and everything shut down, we all like the rest of the country went into just absolute freak out mode. Like who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We had warehouses full of product. And I told the team, I'm like, guys, we cannot feed our families with spike ball sets. We can feed our families with cash. So we have to turn those spike ball sets into cash as soon as possible. Right. Um, and we got to work and we noticed that sales were actually going up and, it didn't make any sense to me until we thought about it for a while and we started hearing from customers and they're all stuck at home looking yep. for something to do. Makes sense. They want to be active and what can you do in your backyard? Uh, what can you do in the front yard? And, you know, spike ball is very portable. You can play it inside. We're seeing a lot of our customers do that. So right. um, our sales have been absolutely fantastic this year. Um, so managing that growth, making sure when, Dick Sporting Goods or Target or any of the other retailers were in calls and says, we need more product. We need to make sure we're in a position to where we can say, yes, we have more. Um, and that, you know, thank God, you know, I've got Scott Palmer, our COO and the rest of our operations team. They have just done an amazing job of uh, making sure that we just don't run out. Um, so the other good news is since we've had to cancel all of our tournaments, right our team that usually runs those, they've been able to actually take a step back and do some long-term planning, which they normally don't have time for. Cause you know, there's almost a tournament every Saturday. We're not running in those, but we're heavily involved in them. And the team has been able to take a step back and say, huh, what do we want tournaments to look like in a year, two year, three year? What do we want the sport on a global perspective to look like? How do we want it to grow? So we've been able to have a lot more strategic discussions around the sport than I think we would have otherwise, which has been a, a very unexpected surprise, but a very welcome one. Gotcha. You know, and, and I'm glad you said that. It, it seems like, you know, uh, due to this pandemic, like you said, there was a lot of panic and stuff like that. But it, it's, it's almost like sometimes when you have these moments, you get to kind of sit back and like, you know, you know, uh, retool and refocus. Uh, and then in your case, you actually, you know, had a nice kind of, uh, sales situation, uh, there. Cause it makes complete sense. If you're at home and you still want to kind of be active and, and still social distance, you can just, you know, play some spike ball in the backyard makes or mm-hmm. in the house for that matter, you know, move around a few tables and chairs and there you go. You know, I have a whole tournament inside the house. You know, I would, yeah. I would love to see somebody, <laughs> uh, kind of like, uh, have like one of those color commentaries for spike ball inside their house. That would be amazing. (laughs) Right. You know, have like the straight man and the color commentary, just kind of doing that. That would be awesome. I would pay to see. Absolutely. For sure. (laughs) Once again, stop up nation. Uh, Is it rooter or rudder? Have I been saying it wrong the whole time? No, it's rooter. You got Uh, it. Okay. Just make sure once again, stop up nation. We're actually wrapping up uh, with Chris rooter, co-founder and CEO uh, of spike ball. I, I want to ask you this, man, because as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we're, we're not only focused on our business, but we have a little bit of a philanthropic side a, a lot of times, uh, in our, in our, in our path. And I know you, you know, uh, contribute thousands of dollars to things like, you know, for gun violence and the environment and education, man, kind of talk about, you know, uh, why that's those three things specifically, why you'd like to focus your time on. 
Yeah, it's a good, good question. I guess mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I feel a responsibility, um, you know, as, as a CEO of a successful company and a fairly well-known brand, you know, still small, but growing. And we've got, a, we've got a sizable microphone or megaphone. You know, our megaphone is much larger than most people. Right. Um, and I feel like I have just been so incredibly lucky in my life, uh, you know, being raised by a family that loves me, that values education and uh, was supportive of me when I did well and when I made mistakes. Right. Um, and I don't know, like there's plenty of people that don't have that. Um, and um, looking at, you know, the question was sort of why education, gun violence and the environment yeah. um, environment, you know, that's something I've felt strongly about for years. And I, I kind of struggle with the company we run. Like I make a product that's made out of, uh, you know, plastic, plastic comes from oil. Um, my product is coming from China all the way to the United States. There's a lot of carbon emissions in that. So how can we adjust that or account for that? Um, and, um, I think it's ridiculous that we're even having, uh, conversations about whether climate change is real. Like that's just, I think offensive. (laughs) Some people still think that it's not a thing. Um, and on the gun violence thing, um, it, I don't think we don't need nearly as many guns as we have. Um, I see that, you know, especially living in Chicago, right. um, it's something that I see in the headlines every single day. Right. Uh, selfishly, I want my neighborhood and I want personally, I want to, to feel safer. Um, but especially I want people that are, you know, sort of seeing that in person on a daily basis. That shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. Right. Um, so, um, and then, yeah, on the education front, um, I'm a huge supporter of, of public schools. Um, I, you know, I, I did public school through eighth grade and then private high school and college. And mm-hmm. um, I, I, I want kids to have opportunities uh, uh, that, that I had. Um, and I, I feel, again, very privileged, very fortunate to be in the position that I'm in. Um, there is something about me that makes me just want to, all right, how can we just make sure that there's, uh, more opportunity for, for others that maybe weren't as lucky as I was, you know, I think I won the genetic lottery by just being born, uh, at the time I was to the family I did. And, um, not everybody wins the lottery. Gotcha. No, I definitely understand that. And, you know, you speak to this kind of growing notion of, you know, altruistic capitalism, you know what I mean? Because a lot of Mm -hmm. times, you know, we hear that word capitalism it, it, a lot of times it's kind of a dirty word, but like, gen- you know, entrepreneurs like yourself and others uh, of this generation are, are really kind of, you know, revamping or rebranding for that matter, the word capitalism, what it means to be a capitalist. It's not all like, you know, money grubbing, you know, you know, CEO, fat cat, you know, sitting on the big desk on, on the 45th floor with his feet up right you know it, it's yep. it's it's uh going out to food pantries and donating food or or in your case uh you know donating money or where wherever it looks like you know and so it's very yep. refreshing to kind of see that what's your take on all that you know where you see entrepreneurs and, and, and stuff doing that yeah i i i think entrepreneurs are responsible for tons of change in this world and, yeah. I, and I love that and mm-hmm. not all of it's good um but I do think that a lot of it does come from entrepreneurs. And I think when you start, um, you know, my, my son came home, uh, not that he came home from school the other day, cause he's doing remote, but <laughs> right. he shared with me a conversation he was having with a classmate and the classmate said something along the lines of how all CEOs and capitalism are just evil. Mm. Um, and she was touting, um, uh, he mentioned something about socialism gotcha. and you know, the, the two are more or less polar opposites and you have to be in, in one bucket. And if you're in one bucket, that means you hate the other bucket and you know, just this, this, this division. Right. And he was asking me about that. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm assuming your friend is saying that cause she's probably uh, hearing it at home. So, right. you know, most kids kind of pick up on what mom and dad are saying. Of course. Um, and I said, you know, if, if I were to be, to have a conversation with her. I'd, I'd want to hear her out. And I'd say, yeah, you know what? There are plenty of CEOs that, that are evil. There are, you know, there's a lot about capitalism 
that is just not fair. And there's a lot about it that's not good, but there, but there is a lot that is good. I do think it needs a significant upgrade and it needs to take more into account than just the bottom line. Um, and, you know, there are some elements, you know, Social Security. I think everybody loves that for the most part. Um, right. That, that's a socialist thing. It is. Um, now, I am not saying I want the United States to become a socialist society. Right. But I do. I would like to pick and choose some things that I think are working pretty well. Right. Um, I'd love to see insurance get completely revamped here. I don't think in health insurance should be tied to a job. Right. I mean, losing a job is stressful enough, but the fact that you get the double whammy of losing your health insurance as well, like, my God. Right. Um, if that's going to make me as a CEO make a little bit less money, that's going to go to my pocket, but it's going to make society as a whole stronger, then sign me up immediately for that. Gotcha. I'm making good money. No mm -hmm. question about that. Right. Um, but if I need to pay a bit more in taxes in order to, then I'm all for that. Gotcha. Uh, so the CEOs that say, you know, that bend over backwards to do everything they can to avoid paying a nickel in taxes. Um, that's what I just don't get. Like, and you know, we, we all can translate sort of what amount is appropriate. Right. Um, but leaving it up to, um, the individual, um, I think is kind of what's gotten us to where we are today. Um, I think if we had some more um, sort of stringent rules at the top and loopholes were being closed, um, then then I think we'd I think we'd be a couple notches closer to society being a little fairer place for sure. No, I I agree with you as well. You know, it, it, it's finding that sense of balance, and, and you're absolutely right. Well, I agree with you about something you said in the sense of like just because you're in one bucket doesn't mean I just necessarily hate the other bucket. Want no other part of the other bucket. Maybe I just want yeah. a little bit of both. You know what I mean? Like I I consider uh, myself a capitalist, but I also you know like the fact that I can go to the library whenever I want to and don't have to pay a fee to get in. You know what I mean? Yes. So yes. You know, I. I think that's is super uh, important. And I think a lot of it, honestly, me personally, I think, you know, our, our generation kind of saw a lot of things, you know, when it comes to th 2008 and uh, and uh, the recession and stuff like that. And so it's just I think maybe this generation of entrepreneurs are just uh, taking a different approach. You know, we're not the same breed as the ones from that that you know the the greed is good era of the 80s you know what i mean so uh the gordon gecko great approach, right? great movie but terrible message right, right? exactly <laughs> exactly for sure and, and i love how you turn that 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 moment with your son into a teachable moment which leads me to my my next to last question you know what do you you know when you retire from spike ball and your and your kids are kind of toasting your success in there present you with that gold watch and they give you that speech man and they say my dad's legacy is what are they going to say man what do you hope they're going to say i'm hoping they're going to say they'll highlight some good that came about from the company right um Yes, I have a feeling there's going to be some pretty impressive financial numbers that we'll we'll be able to to brag about. Right. Um, profit generated, et cetera, employees hired, you know, lives changed. And you know, uh, I am hoping though that we will be able to say that, yeah, Spikeball was able to, you know, in a tiny fashion or a major fashion, I don't know, but just help bridge some things or um, just help, I guess is just the word. Gotcha. Um, it it did some good. Got gotcha. you. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, once again, Startup Nation, we're like I said, we're wrapping up with Chris Ruder, founder and CEO of Spikeball. And once again, if you want to check out Spikeball, we have the link there in the show notes, spikeball.com. Uh, and also check out the Facebook page. There's some really cool uh, videos. There's some people uh, playing Spikeball with mask and social distancing. So I think that's kind of cool uh, <laughs> as well. And like I said, we have that link in the show notes if you listen to the replay on the podcast so chris man i'm actually gonna turn this microphone over to you man because with everything going on uh people are feeling a little discouraged give us some words of encouragement to take us out for today uh i do genuinely believe it's going to get better um i think i am an eternal optimist um i don't know if i'm the, the right person to try and give sort of the rah-rah speech but gotcha. um 
I would encourage everybody um, to listen. You know, I think this, 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 this conversation has been fantastic. I've loved it. Um, uh, some people may treat what I'm saying as I'm being a bit preachy or I'm wagging a finger. Um, I'm not trying to do that. I am trying to share my perspective. Um, but, you know, as with um, the, the example I gave the conversation with my son, I wanted to be able to teach him. But I also did let him know that um, when I, if I were to get the chance to speak with his classmate, I would not immediately say, you are wrong and here is why. Right. I'd begin it with wanting to listen, wanting to learn. So she had some experience or her parents had some experience to let her know that CEOs and capitalism are terrible. Right. Um, and I'd want to listen to that first and then hopefully we could have some sort of uh, conversation and I will now be smarter at the end of that one and hopefully they would as well. For sure. And, and, I, and I agree with that sentiment as well. I, I, honestly, I think 90 percent, I believe me personally, maybe even not naive. I don't know. But I believe 90 percent of people can be reasoned with the other 10 percent. You were never going to reach them anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> Good point. But, but but 90 I think 90 percent of people can be reasoned with if you're if you're listening, willing to listen, willing to be open uh, and honestly willing to be vulnerable a little bit. I, I think we can make a lot of headway on a lot of different topics and issues if we are all just willing to kind of sit down and listen to one another. So I appreciate you sharing that, man, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you for this opportunity. This has been great. No worries. And that's going to wrap up this session of the startup life. Once again, we want to thank Chris Ruder, founder, CEO of Spikeball. And thank you so much, brother. Dominic, it's been a pleasure. Always. And as always, Startup Nation, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, If you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.